welcome to this discussion on well-being and high density in a time after COVID. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. I hope you're all keeping well wherever you are. Uh, of course, at the moment, that's very likely to be at home. Um, over the last year, many of us have spent far more time at home than we ever imagined would be possible. Um, for some, that's been a positive experience. But for many, it's been a challenging time in which existing housing inequalities have become further entrenched. I think either way, uh, lockdown confinement has sh shone a spotlight on the role that our homes and neighbourhoods can have on our well wider well-being. And as we begin to move out of what's hopefully a final lockdown, it feels like an important moment to reflect on some of the changes that might come about as a result of uh, the pandemic. So my name's Kyle Buchanan, I'm a director at Archeo, um, an architecture practice that specialises in housing. Naturally, we have a particular interest in how people live together in cities and how this might change over the coming years. So today, uh, we've been invited by the London Society to host uh, what I think will be a very interesting webinar. Um, and we're asking whether the impacts of COVID will mean a renewed focus on well-being or whether the shine has in fact come off city living altogether. So I'm joined by four fantastic speakers tonight who are gonna kick things off with a short presentation before we move into a panel discussion um, and then hopefully some questions from the audience. Um, so I've been asked to um, ask you all audience members, if you will use the Q and A function, please to put your questions in. I will then read those out um, to our panelists and uh, we'll, uh, see if we can get an interesting discussion going. So um, I'm just going to introduce our speakers. Starting us off tonight is uh, Natasha Reed. Natasha is uh, the founder of Matter Space Soul, which is a specialist architecture and design lab, shaping places for human well-being. Tonight, she's going to uh, talk to us about the themes in her new manifesto, Urban Empathy, and how, when it comes to well-being, designers should be thinking from the inside out. Um, up next is Felice Crickler, Felice is a director at Asale Architects, and alongside being one of the practices Build to Rent experts, she's leading several research initiatives, including on designing for well-being. Um, Felice is going to talk to us today about the relationship between density and health, health outcomes in buildings, and she's going to touch on some of Asale's recent projects that tackle those difficult questions. Our third speaker tonight is Jacob Wilson, who is an urban designer and head of design at Barkey and Dagenham's regeneration company, Be First, who I'm sure many of you know. Um, Jacob is gonna to talk to us tonight about the impact of COVID on the borough, and he'll be showing us three projects that Be First are delivering that prioritize the health and well-being of residents. And finally this evening, uh, we welcome Daniel Slade, who is a policy and project manager at the Town and Country Planning Association, Daniel's leading the TCPA's work on the Healthy Homes Act campaign, and he's going to tell us all about that this evening. It's a fascinating campaign to um, essentially enshrine well-being in law. So I'm feeling very excited about this. I hope you're all looking forward to what I think is going to be a fantastic discussion. Uh, do stick with us till the end and um, hopefully uh, ask some interesting and challenging questions. Uh, without further ado, I'll hand over to Natasha to kick us off. Great, thanks, Carl. Um, uh, it's, good evening, everyone. It's, it's a pleasure to be here tonight. Um, I'm going to just start sharing my screen. Uh, and hopefully that all works. Um, so um, as Carl mentioned, I'm going to be advocating for uh, the concept uh, of urban empathy. And this is not a, a new idea in terms of design. Um, it's been written about quite a lot. I think in terms of the narratives of development, it's quite a shift. Um, and uh, I think there's no doubt, particularly at the moment, um, that places have such a significant impact on our health, our well-being, and our happiness. Um, but when it comes to actually making the built worlds that are our habitats, the most crucial of questions, which is how a place will affect the people that spend time there, and what will be the impact on their lives, these really fundamental questions are actually rarely, if ever, asked. Um, so the, the concept is a sort of um, high-level idea in that we need a radical shift um, to be able to make cities 
neighborhoods, homes and places from the inside out, which is looking at how places affect uh, our inner workings uh, as human beings. And I think it's clear that, um, just go to the next slide, yeah. It's clear that um, as we're, we're, we're going through the pandemic, um, it's, uh, we can't really just go back to the way that things were before. Um, there's a sort of longer term shift to be had, I'm sure, um, with, the, with sort of health, well-being, and also the effect in terms of socioeconomic kind of inequalities uh, has been highlighted so much by the crisis. Um, so in terms of when we're making places, uh, I think health and well-being can't really be an, an add-on. It's, it's about really uh, fundamentally shifting the way that we see places so it can be they can be enablers for life um, and not uh, considered as assets uh, simply and uh, so this this is a, a review uh, the Marmot review which is a follow-on from a long-range um, study uh, commissioned by the government uh, looking at how critical our surroundings really can be so in the original study uh, it's been reported that People living in the, in the poorest neighbourhoods in England uh, will have a lower life expectancy than people living in the richest neighbourhoods. Um, so the, the more extensive the housing deprivation, essentially, uh, the more damaging the effect on people's quality of life, health and life chances. Um, so, so it's really fundamental. Uh, and this is because our environments are um, part of something called the social determinants of health. And uh, in short, these are the non-medical factors that shape health outcomes for people. So, uh, and as part of that neighborhood uh, and our living environment are quite a critical factor uh, amongst many other things as well that you can see from this slide. Um, and uh, the, the, what we've seen as well with the pandemic um, is that when people are in a position of disadvantage, um, this compounds to affect many different factors uh, in our lives. So, for example, poor quality housing uh, can affect uh, a child's ability to, to concentrate, whether they're at school or at home, uh, it can impact in terms of stress. Um, and they're kind of uh, eventually over their life, their life chances affecting uh, job prospects. Um, and and it's a, it becomes a, it's a sort of cyclical um, problem with hardship increasing the others, uh, making people and people sort of worse and worse off. So I think when we're, we're talking about um, health and well-being, there's, there's different um, depths and levels that we can go to and uh, potentially as, as um, designers and the built environment industry can really look at these uh, more kind of pressing issues, uh, even though they are complex, but uh, I think it's, it's the time to start uh, thinking how these things can come together. Um, so the, the, the idea for, for urban, more urban empathy uh, is about how, how we can look at not only just using uh, urban space and our environments differently, but actually to, to reimagine that basis of how we, we uh, think about making places and uh, going from the perspective of what they can do for people. So here uh, I've, I've shown two examples of different um, perspectives uh, to do with well-being. So one is um, the from the Well Building Institute, um, how places affect us um, through through a couple of different factors that we've got here and uh, in terms of mental health, in terms of uh, sort of uh, providing natural light, um, fresh air, good quality water. And then on the left here is, is a different type of um, uh, way of considering how places affect people. And this is um, from Bureau Hapold and looking at flourishing. So the definition of how um, we uh, are a sort of quality of life in terms of mental health in particular. And there's many, there's a couple of different frameworks uh, that all look at uh, our quality of life in different ways. Um, and these can uh, 
it's sort of looking at places from the perspective of creating outcomes for people essentially and working from often scientific and evidence-based principles in terms of psychology Uh, and so on. So, um, as in terms of the way uh, that uh, we look at how places um, can impact people, it's uh, looking at the sort of, we've called it human performance, and it's essentially about the experience that you have um, uh, in terms of different perspectives. So, uh, the first is how places can uh, nourish us, which is about uh, more of a biological lens where it's about how places uh, provide comfort, um, our foundational needs like spaciousness, light, not being overcrowded, um, security, and uh, th then we move on to how places can lift us and this is about uh, the emotional qualities of place, um, so creating places that create positive emotions such as joy and wonder. and that feeds into uh, how places can better connect us. So how, um, I guess it's something at the moment that's, that's so important is how to create uh, environments that encourage sociability, that can support neighborliness, community sense of belonging. Um, and that can be done through the, through the organization um, of space and how that can work, whether it's within a pandemic or going back to sort of slightly more uh, normal situations and just to sort of uh, I'm aware of time just to, to sort of touch on the other ones how places can better root us so that's uh, providing a sense of belonging uh, an identity and it's having a spirit of place um, to more fundamental considerations about how how places can grow us so in terms of uh, the economic um, potential that it can provide to people um, so that covers affordability um, and the, the social capital that you find uh, often with, with uh, close networks and communities. And lastly, it's about how places can empower us. So that's kind of the, the really big um, question. Um, how can places uh, tap, sort of, uh, tap into solving um, or contributing to equality? Um, and people achieving their, their aspirations and um, having opportunities in life. So that's um, this, this is a sort of uh, ambition uh, in terms of, sort of shifting the way that places could be seen. And uh, an example of how those sorts of ideas can be applied, uh, this is a, a high density uh, housing concept, which is about more collective models of li living. Um, so, uh, so doing high density but at human scale and so this uh, image here is about how to create more um, sociable uh, formats uh, in terms of clustering the, the apartments together and within those clusters it creates micro communities where people um, are able to, to meet more organically and uh, form relationships even when you're living in a um, high density multi um, level developments where, where often it's uh, more difficult than say street level developments um, and this is uh, an example of, of what that could um, be like where you create spaces for uh, people to, to see one another so it's, it's about visual interaction the flow of people through that um, space and how you encounter one another um, uh, so, uh, thinking particularly about loneliness at the moment, uh, it's been a, an issue uh, prior to the pandemic, but obviously now it's uh, a very, very um, pressing issue to tackle. So that's something um, to sort of working with different uh, developers and companies to look at that. Um, so just to, to round off quickly, um, if uh, this is there's a, a new publication um, which uh, is called Sound of Advice and this is, uh, there's a piece in there about uh, uh, social inequality, uh, race and well-being, uh, if you want to have a little bit more of a look at that. Um, and 
the publication comes out in April. Uh, it's written by 50 urbanists um, and architects of colour. Um, and yes, to end, um, I suppose it's, yeah, empathy is, is about producing a return on investment, but shifting the way that value is, is understood uh, in terms of impacts on people's lives, well-being and happiness alongside um, economic growth and capital. So it's a whirlwind um, tour of that, but I hope uh, that was uh, a good setting for the rest of the discussion. Thank, thank you very much, Natasha. That was really interesting. I think uh, as designers and people working in housing, we all uh, need to focus on empathy and putting ourselves in the place of uh, residents and people living in the homes that we're producing. Um, Felice, I'll hand over to you. Well, is that what is? Yeah, you... we can see your screen. Okay. Brilliant. So I've got lots of notes as well, so I'm going to speak really fast. Um, I'm Felice from Estelle Architect, and I'm an architect. Um, and looking into the sort of topic set for the evening, um, the interesting thing I sort of found about um, dense urban living is that you can find so much research um, on why high density is bad for you because we're detached from the natural world, it's bad for our mental health um, and our physical health. Uh, we're more at risk of obesity and respiratory diseases because as a result of um, air pollution, we're more at risk of loneliness and, and ensuing sort of psychiatric disorders um, as a consequence. But actually, you can also find um, an equivalent amount of research, pretty much, um, stating the benefits of dense cities. Um, they're smaller, therefore, um, they're more environmentally and, and sort of socially sustainable. They're more active. Um, walking, cycling and using public transport is easier and there's less reliance on, on car use. They're rich with a mix of um, uses and activities and, and there's um, potentially more opportunities for social um, interaction. So I think that it's, um, it is one of the points is that it's really important um, to consider how we experience uh, density living. Um, and this great LSE uh, report, which is pre-COVID, um, did just that. It sort of went to look at and talk to residents of a variety of high density developments um, and, um, and sort of interview them. Um, and then noted that there was a wide range of lived experiences across the developments, uh, but also from with, within the same developments, from the very negative um, to the very positive. And the, the, one of the conclusions was that density alone doesn't determine whether these residential environments are in fact experienced negatively or positively. But it's a combination of density and other factors like design, build quality, open spaces, security, the location, infrastructure, services, the people and the people's um, personal circumstances as well that really creates a sense of place. And the greater the density, the more important it then becomes to get all these other factors um, right. And as an architect, there was one recommendation that really I found really sort of key. Um, and it was um, the fact that post occupancy evaluation should become standard um, um, in all developments, but in particular for sort of potentially difficult sort of um, uh, more difficult um, developments and th that the findings can then be used to improve um, the existing and, and future developments and the architects, the design teams, the clients can then be fully aware of the outcomes of, of their design um, decisions. So our experience of city living, our experiences of city living are varied. Um, and a lot of it is based on our personal circumstances. And if we now look at COVID, um, it really, it doesn't come, off, come as a surprise that COVID has not been experienced equally um, with, as Natasha was saying, much higher risk um, for people living in deprived areas. And data suggest, interestingly, that density isn't a major factor in increasing infection risk, but it's overcrowding that's the real issue. So I think we sort of have a responsibility before we even talk about well-being um, that we probably need to address the issue of basic needs of decent housing for all. Um, 
poor quality housing, overcrowding, lack of housing and poor health are all interconnected and they really need to be at the top um, of, of the post um, COVID um, um, agenda. Um, and I mean, the links between housing and health um, uh, are, are not new, and I'm sure Daniel will talk about it later. But you know, if we go back to the mid 19th century, the Public Health Act of 1848 was one of the first steps to improve public health uh, in order to improve living conditions for, for the uh, working classes, but um, to reduce preventable diseases in, in urbanizing Britain. And Henry Roberts um, published the, um, his, uh, one of his books, The Essentials of a Healthy Dwelling, and in 1862. And if, if you haven't read it, I would, um, I would um, recommend to do so because it's actually really current in many ways and, and, uh, and incredibly modern in the sort of um, healthy design principles that, that it sets out. So I think as we come out slowly of, of the crisis, there's, there's probably two parts. The first one is where we immunize everyone so they can continue to live in unhealthy homes. And there's the second one where we immunize everyone, um, but we also take the time to reflect on how the crisis has affected the wider population and, and how a more radical change can come out. Um, so I sort of did quite a bit of reading and there's so much about it at the moment. Um, I sort of asked myself, what would a radical change look like and what as an architect and sort of playing an active role in, in the built environment, what, what can I do? Um, and I sort of put together a long list, I'm just going to go through it quickly, of sort of propositions, because I think that actually there are, it's, it, it, there are many decisions that can be done and at different scales from, from the very small to, to the very large ones that will have le less sort of influence on. I think the key thing is starting with the smallest doll of this um, this diagram, this picture. It's it's really thinking about the people, and as Natasha was saying, it's it's putting the people at heart, the heart of the design, um, by engaging meaningfully and really designing for people. Going up, we're starting to look at homes, and you know what changes in homes, um, we really need to um, design new sustainable homes where sustainability is not seen as a luxury, but actually it's um, delivering an effic energy efficiency to its residents and it's making homes cheaper uh, to run for everyone. We should consider adaptability and flexibility within the homes uh, and possibility of sort of different life scenarios happening in our homes. And we've all tried to improve our homes. So I think there's, there's, we should also look at prior, prioritizing ways of helping those who are most in need of improvements um, in, in their living spaces, but don't necessarily have uh, the means to do so. In terms of the building scale and developments, we really need to think again about what urban density looks like um, and, and this, try to design out the negative aspects of density. We need to consider housing typologies that um, offer a variety of external spaces from shared to private that address the street with a series of thresholds that can accommodate a discussion and the, sort of the idea of progressive privacy. Um, and as I mentioned before, we need to go back to schemes to understand, to under, undertake post-occupancy evaluation um, um, and, and think about how we're designing. At the neighborhood scale, we should be using our neighborhoods more as proximity hubs and trying to reinforce um, neighborhood networks um, and opportunities through uh, mixed use programs that work for neighborhoods. There's the designing for children and families, creating walkable neighborhoods with the right users in the right place, uh, focusing on public space and its versatility so that it can be used for a number of different um, uses. And obviously green spaces, inclusive, accessible and of high quality and also of a varied scale because we found that some really small green spaces have worked really well during the sort of lockdown time. So it's not necessarily just the, the, the size of it. At the city scale, um, we 
the high streets are often talked about, but it's a reality. We need to rethink of our high streets as places to shop, share resources, work, make, but also live, I think. Um, and I think that promoting the idea of a 15 minute city um, to effectively, in a way, decentralize our um, sort of established um, economic center and easing pressure of, of public transport is going to be key. And the last one I've called overarching principles, but it's probably just general principles that didn't really fit, fit in any other category. Um, um, it's um, embedding the principles of healthy place making into practice and readdressing the city, city living to provide a healthy habitat that works for everyone and a setting where, where we're going to be a bit more self-sufficient. Um, developing the later living sector in the UK to try and create more aspirational homes for all the people that enable us to not only um, age better, reduce loneliness, but also in turn incentivize the care profession. Um, and, and lastly, reconsider how we value things. I mean, you know, today the um, UK GBC um, published their social value framework, and I think there's probably a real opportunity this time um, to do this. So I don't really have a conclusion, but um, the, the question that Carl was asking was, has the shine come off city living? And um, um, I mean, I think some people will decide to move out because it suits their personal circumstances, but I think urban living will not only remain a necessity, but um, a positive choice um, and an exciting place to live. And these are just a few, just very few images of projects that we are currently working on and that are really exciting and that it's actually quite interesting thinking about these principles I was just saying and seeing that actually they, they are all things that we're trying to put in place um, at the moment. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you very much, Felice. I'm going to hand straight over to Jacob. I think you touched on some really important themes there, um, which I'm sure we will unpack more in the um, in the discussion afterwards. Jacob. Oh, I think you're still on mute, Jacob. I don't know. If, uh, Sorry, go. apologies, Kyle. Um, can you see my screen OK? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. OK, thank you. Thanks to London Society and Archive for putting on this uh, event this evening and asking me uh, to talk. Um, I'm Jacob Wilson, Head of Design at Be First. And for those that don't know Be First, uh, we're a development company and planning service wholly owned by Barkin and Dagenham Council and work exclusively uh, within the borough. So in this brief uh, period of time, this eight minute presentation, I'm going to touch on, you know, the impact of COVID on Barking and Dagenham and particularly our residents, and then show you three projects that we're currently delivering, which will, I think, really showcase the importance of health and well-being um, for us uh, in, a, in our portfolio. I just want to start with this um, quote um, from, from Darren Rodwell, and I think, you know, I think it's, it's really important just for setting the scene in terms of the impact on, on our residents of Barking and Dagenham. Many of the characteristics that make Barking and Dagenham and the rest of East London such a unique place have also contributed to the disproportionate impact of the pandemic on our residents. And I think, you know, what's, what's really interesting about this is it shows that it's not just, it's not just city living and thinking about what Felice was saying, it's, it's not just density, but it's specific circumstances. And we know that the specific circumstances for us in Barking and Dagenham relate to deprivation that's, in, that's found in the borough. And it raises specific issues such as overcrowding, multi-generational households, lack of decent outdoor space, and working in frontline roles where working from home isn't, isn't an option. I think it's really interesting. It also draws on research that's come out recently by uh, LSE, which maps this data. It maps this data in cities, not just in the UK, but cities around the world, which shows COVID infections uh, rates relate more to um, inequality uh, and, and poverty that's found in cities rather than density in, in cities, uh, city living per se. So I think, um, you know, it's so all thinking about how, how uh, whether the pandemic will take the shine off living in London. I don't think it will. I think London, you know, is a very big, rich, layered city. It's very resilient. I think what's interesting for me is how we respond to the health inequalities that we knew were there before, before COVID, but have really exaggerated the impact um, of COVID on certain parts um, of the city. So going on to the, 
Uh, so going on to the first of three projects I want to share with you, this is the Gas Corn Estate, uh, which is in Barking Town Centre. And we're doing a lot of work in, on the Gas Corn Estate. We're delivering around 3,000 homes, um, two new schools, several, uh, several parks and, and uh, multiple community centres as well. So it's a significant investment as it be first, and it's just south of the town centre. As part of this regeneration project, last year we commissioned White Architecture Public Works um, alongside Europa to do a placemaking strategy. And the team came up with a, with, um, with a suggestion of embedding the 15-minute city. They recognised that this was a really good place where we can embed this really great planning ideal, which I know has come out of, of Paris and the mayor working in Paris on these kind of ideals over there. I think it is, it is a fabulous idea and it really suits this location. So as you can see on this map, you have Gascoigne Estate in the centre. To the north, you have Barking Town Centre in the train station, Abbey Grounds. Um, to, the, to the west, you have the River Roding. To the east, Greatfield Park. And to the south, um, where it says Cycle Soup Highway 3, to the south of that, you've got River Road and Thames Road, where we're investing heavily in new employment space. I think, you know, the, the estate has felt very inward looking in the past. The estate has been kind of surrounded by, by large roads and been cut off by the dominance of the cars. So we've worked hard with this placemaking strategy to really reduce the impact of the cars. So to think about how we can downgrade the roads, improve the crossing and create new green routes and really prioritise pedestrian and cycle movement, both through the estate but and um, connecting to the wider area. I think the other key thing about this, this um, the placemaking strategy is delivering fantastic new green parks. So part of the identity of the Gascoigne Estate, which our residents told us in the past, was it had these you know, dispersed uh, public spaces, so very small public spaces, which were dispersed around um, the estate. A lot of our residents felt a sense of crime um, in the areas or a fear of crime in these areas. So what we've done is created much larger spaces and they're aimed at multiple generations, multiple uses. So we create a buzz and a buzz and a site a sense of excitement in these public um, in these public spaces. The next uh, project I want to sh uh, show is a related project, which is where we deliver in a pocket park. And I think what's, this is going to be a temporary park. I think what's really interesting about this pocket park is that we've done it through a co-design process. So we're increasingly using co-design processes uh, with our residents. And this has wholly been done online. So in the virtual domain, we have started this project um, over the last year, and here you can see two of the mood boards um, that we've used in this virtual domain to communicate with our residence forum. And it's a really iterative process. You know, so we've worked hard with our residents to create the brief. The landscape architects who are fabric landscape team, they then respond to that brief, come up with the design, which you can see on the right, and then go back to the residents and it carries on with that iterative process of working really intensely uh, with, our, with our residents, thinking about how we can upskill them with design skills and empower them through the process. I think what's really interesting about this is, you know, some of the key issues that they've, that they've, that they've said through this process is that they want spaces for play, areas for sport, areas for art. These are the type of things that we would have had pre-COVID, but increasingly we found more weight around area for people to come together and areas for adults to congregate. So again, put an emphasis on this multi-generational spaces and the, the message that we're hearing loud and clear is that these spaces should be communal spaces. They should be programmed. They should encourage communal activity. So thinking about spaces where people can do yoga, where they can plant their fruit and veg or herb gardens, and where uh, spaces for, for meditation um, or coming together and running events. This is what our residents are telling us. And this is what we're designing through this process. I think the other thing is, you know, sustainability is a big part of what we're doing in the gas and saying what we're doing in Be First. And this park has been designed through circular economy principles. So we're using uh, waste materials from the demolition of, of, of nearby buildings or, 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 or materials that were found in those buildings to re recycle them or upcycle them and use them um, on this temporary park. And then the last pro project that I wanted to show relates to our housing program. So what we do at BeFirst is primarily about housing. We're, we're gearing up to be delivering around a thousand um, new homes a year. 70 to 75 percent of our program is affordable housing. I think you know a cornerstone of thinking about health and well-being has to be security of tenure, and that is really important with the Barking and Dagenham, where we do have some overcrowding. We have large waiting lists. You know, we want to be delivering good quality, sustainable housing to meet that demand and, uh, demand and provide the security of tenure. This is a more unusual project for us. So this is a house for artists. Uh, it's been uh, commissioned in collaboration between London Borough of Barking and Dagenham, 
Great London um, and the GLA. And I think I, I just wanted to showcase this today because I think it shows one of our more innovative projects. So this is, because it's a house for artists, it has artistic studios on ground floor. It's got a wonderful courtyard to the rear, which is going to have a, a Grayson Perry vase in it, we believe. And above that, you have 12, um, 12 apartments. And to get access to one of those apartments, you have to be an artist. And you get 65, you get the rent is 65% market rate. But the trade-off for that is that you have to give half a day's week community service. Um, um, so back using art programs, going in school, using community art classes. That is the trade-off. So that is what we get back. That is what the community gets back from this reduction in rent. And I think the really other interesting thing about this project is it's co-living. So what you can see in front of you is actually three apartments and each of those apartments within the party wall has a sliding door. So each of those doors can be closed to create your own apartment or open to create much more of a communal living space. So this won't be to everyone's taste, uh, I'm sure, and it's probably not safe necessarily in, in COVID times in terms of creating your own family bubble, bubble. But I think it really does demonstrate, you know, an approach to an innovative approach, an exciting approach to kind of embedding social value and, and embedding a community feel uh, into, into one of our developments. I'm just going to finish as well with this John Ruskin uh, quote, which I feel is really important to the work we're doing in Barking. The measure of any great civilization is in its cities, and a measure of a city's greatness is to be found in the quality of its public spaces, its parks, and its squares. And, you know, I think London is a very resilient city, and I think it has fabulous parks and squares, uh, which will support its resilience post-COVID. But they're not equally distributed, and I think it's really important to think about that distribution of these type of assets, community assets, public assets, green infrastructure, and how we plan our cities and our neighbourhoods post-COVID. Thanks, Carol. Thanks, Jacob. There's a, a huge amount to unpack there. I think a uh, quick thought is I think it's great to see um, a local authority development company like Be First pushing uh, innovative tenures like co-housing for artists. I think that's, that's very exciting. Um, Daniel. I'll hand over to you. Hello, yeah, uh, just set up my screen sharing. <clears throat> got your slides on the re at the ready. Yeah. Uh, got... Yeah, I am absolutely chuffed that um, the last presentation finished with a reference to Ruskin, considering that Ruskin was one of the sort of key inspirations, along with uh, William Morris, to the foundation of the TCPA in 1899. And, and in itself, it's quite interesting that uh, it was founded on concerns about the health impacts of urban life and living on, 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 on inhabitants of the, the big cities of the country. And we're just back at dealing with these issues again. Uh, so this has been a long-term concern for there's a whole history of the organization. And we've been working on this particular thing I'm gonna talk about today for um, a couple of years now, about two years, maybe three years of generally thinking around the topic, but really focused work over the last year and working on this wider space for the last couple of years. So I want to talk about a, a quite fundamental solution um, to a lot of the problems which have been identified, I think, by uh, the other, some of the other panellists today. It's a real, it's a legislative shift in the way that we regulate the built environment. Um, and yeah, it will hopefully um, enable greater innovation and also provide a baseline which stops the worst examples of development we can see today. Um, a few of the, uh, my sort of fellow speakers today have spoken about this prompt, which we, we got in our notes before we started. This question that has the shine come off of uh, living in cities uh, and I think all of us more or less have got to the point that well it depends if that shine was there in the first place for, for some of us. Um, experiences of urban living vary drastically and have been amplified by Covid but they always have very drastically. Uh, but I think it's important to situate that into a kind of policy context of where we are at the moment, where we are, where we are at the moment in terms of um, the, the tools we've got our ability to try and make um, urban living as, as positive as possible and then where we're trying to get to and what we need to get there. So I'm gonna begin with a slide I often use when I'm speaking, especially with parliamentarians about this, this the Healthy Homes um, the healthy homes Bill, which I'll describe in more detail in a minute. Um, and I asked them to, to see if they can um, spot the housing. Like where is, where's the housing on this slide? And they can normally point to this sort of arc of housing at the top along that, the side of that uh, tram line is actually. And then at the top right, there's another line of housing along the, an old railway. And what is almost always missed is this in the centre of the image. So this is an active industrial estate. It's about 15 minutes from where I'm currently sitting in southwest London. This is in Mitcham. Um, there's, you can see a, a concrete um, a processing plant just across the road from this, this building. Uh, there's a big industrial bakery just behind it. Uh, heavy goods vehicles that thunder down the road at quite high speeds. 
And this is um, where these people are living. It's extremely small accommodation in the past, mainly used for uh, families who are on the housing waiting list. There's no space for children to play. Uh, if they do play, they need to play in the road with these heavy goods vehicles moving by. There's been complaints to the local MP about the, um, the dust in the air from all this, the manufacturing around the area, uh, making it a, a difficult for their children to breathe. And there's also been reports that the, the, the size of the flats inside this development are so small that children aren't able to learn to walk properly. And this is an example of a home delivered through permitted development rights. This is a um, old commercial building in the middle of an industrial estate, which has been converted into homes without having to go through the planning system. Uh, and as a result of that, there are very, very few checks and balances. So this is official government policy. This has been slowly expanded since about 2013. And I think it's really important to get a sense of the baseline of where we are now. Um, yeah, there's been plenty of research into the, the health and well-being consequences of these kinds of developments. Uh, government commissioned research found that about one fifth, uh, only one fifth met nationally described space standards of the homes delivered through this route. Um, about only 72% had a single aspect window and 10 had no windows at all. Until very recently, it was perfectly legal to develop these homes, whether you're converting a warehouse or converting an office block, without actually having to have any windows at all and only 3.5% had access to private amenity space. So I think permitted development rights, and I'll come back to them in a minute, represents some of the, the worst of um, the regulatory system we have at the moment for trying to secure health and wellbeing. So it's not a, um, a, gr a great consideration in the system at all. Um, but we do have to acknowledge as well, I think, that um, it's still the majority of poor quality developments, but unacceptably low quality developments come through the planning system itself. Um, and I'll continue. I think I want to pause at this, this point because I think it is really important. And I've had so many conversations recently with uh, academics, with uh, actually with Homes England as well, various different parties all working on these um, really quite creative and well thought through and innovative schemes and, and the government's own work as well on design codes around how we can build cities which are um, better for people's health and well-being and support these things. But they don't take into account the fact that now we're in a situation where the vast majority of new developments in urban centres, city centres, uh, town centres across the country, um, planners have no control over these developments. Um, they have a very limited number of th things which fall into prior approval, which uh, they have a checklist they can check new developments against. And most of the things we're concerned about, so the, that example there, which is in terms of uh, location, um, and, and very re until very recently, the, the size of each of the individ individual units, couldn't be considered in planning applications. And that, so that's, we have to think about the tools you've actually currently got to try and implement these things we know we need. And we, we're at an unbelievably low bar at the moment when it comes to that. And what's so frustrating about this is I think the evidence has, as has already been pointed out, has been clear for a century uh, on the links between our homes and our health and our well-being, and wider neighbourhoods as well, because that's obviously of extreme importance. I'm going to skip over this because I've got a lot to cover, but um, I think that's well established. I mean, actually, uh, it was worth mentioning this point about the uh, the cost, the financial cost to our, our um, healthcare system of poor quality housing. BRE estimated it to be about £1.4 billion a year, and that was a few years ago. Um, I'd imagine that figure to be higher now. Uh, and in the very first place, when, they, when and the TCPA had a hand in this, the, the planning system was first formed, it was always visualised as being that first part of the, the welfare state. So the, 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 the planning system prevents you from getting ill, and then the NHS patches you up if you do get ill. And it was meant to function together like that. So there's a really strong place, I think, clearly for legal change. Uh, the system's clearly dysfunctional if we're ending up with outcomes like those I, I've just shown you. Um, so we need to change fundamentally the way that we regulate the built environment. And this isn't just planning, this is housing and all the other various routes of um, regulation in the built environment, which link together to create this kind of tangled mess. Um, planning itself lacks a, a, a legally defined clear core purpose, I think. Um, that's debatable, but I would definitely say that's the case. Uh, the responsibility for the built environment is split, as I just mentioned, between all these different regimes. So I'm sure those of us in the audience who work in architecture or urban development will have entered into conversations where someone says, oh, no, that's not a planning issue. That's a housing issue. Or that's not a housing issue. That falls into uh, health and safety. And it's all uh, artificially fragmented when it comes down to just um, the quality of the built environment, people's actually lived experiences. Um, I think it's also really important to mention, and I think this is something which many of the public would assume isn't the case, is that there are no legally enforceable minimum standards on 
aspects of building design and the urban environment, which we know are fundamentally important to people's health and well-being. So this is things like access to green space, uh, amenity space, uh, a walkable public realm. All these things we know are so sort of fundamentally biologically important to people, and yet there's no guarantees around them. So we need a shift in our regulatory system, uh, especially in the light of COVID, from one which is about mitigating the worst, um, the, the worst aspects of the built environment and, and impacts on health and well-being, and to one which is built around active promotion um, of health and, and health and well-being. And in a sense, I think um, the challenge we, we always receive is that, oh, this is impossible. As much as this this is this sounds like a, um, laudable claims. Uh, it's, it, it's, it's just not durable to regulate in such a holistic way. And I don't think that's true. Um, the Parker Myers standards existed for decades and had a really fundamental role in shaping council, the creation of council homes, which still to this day have really high standards in terms of natural light and access to greenery. And they were holistic standards, which weren't just about the fabric of buildings. So how does this um, piece of legislation we developed uh, I should say in collaboration with a whole range of different groups. How does this piece of legis legislation actually work? Well, I think to counter for it very quickly, and I'm happy to answer questions on this later, there are three pillars to the bill split between each of these um, parts and clauses you can see in the, the table of contents. So first of all, we have the real bookend, the kind of reorientating um, duties which we have sandwiched at the, uh, on, either, on sort of either end of the way that the, the bill works. The first of these is a duty on the Secretary of State. Um, to consider or secure the health, safety and well-being of um, all people in the built environment, essentially. And that's a long-winded, long legalistic way we've used here to explain it, because we borrowed from other bits of legislation. But essentially what this does is requires all policy areas, um, which are the responsibility of the Secretary of State, whether this is housing, whether this is planning, it cuts across all of these, uh, to consider health and well-being within it. It's that shift towards positive promotion of these things. And that creates that kind of responsibility and context in the first place. The second uh, key sort of bookend duty is around uh, affordable housing. So um, again, um, another participant early in the presentation in a presentation uh, pointed out the significance of affordable housing to well-being, and this this part recognises that in the legislation and provides a genuinely affordable definition rather than the government's version of affordability. So we're getting to the, the core of the bill now, and the whole bill is orientated around what we call the healthy homes principles. So these do not define particular standards in terms of uh, quantified levels of light or floor space or this kind of thing, but there are a series of principles which define what constitutes a healthy home, very quite, high, quite broadly speaking. We think of them as the absolute basic sort of biological need of human beings, full stop in terms of where they live. Uh, we also based our decisions around what were included, uh, partly on the expert advice, but also on what we felt the, the, the general public would assume had been accounted for somewhere out there in these, this tangled mass of legislation and policy and law, but which just fundamentally isn't accounted for in many ways. And those, those guarantees don't exist. So what the government will be required to do is to work on these principles, which I'll introduce in a second, build a uh, white paper which ex explains how all um, aspects of government policy and regulation would satisfy those principles. And this creates a trickle down effect where um, eventually you have local plans and local policy would have to respond to the changes in national policy, which would embed these rules. But all this time, being in primary legislation, it would always mean that there is recourse back to the healthy homes principles. If a community, a developer, a local authority felt that developments were being planned, which didn't fit with these fundamental principles around, around uh, healthy homes. So we can have a look at the kind of things these are. They're, like I said, it, uh, painfully basic when we think that so many homes are delivered about these things. So we have access to natural light, uh, we've got inclusivity and accessibility, um, minimum space required for people's day-to-day uh, -day needs, uh, can keep moving through. We also have noise pollution covered in there as well, thermal comfort, obviously extremely significant as well. Uh, and then resilience to climate change throughout the lifetime of, of the building as well. So I mentioned briefly before about how this would work in terms of process and the way that the government would create a white paper, uh, which would lay out how they will um, alter the national planning policy framework or their guidance to be in conformity with these principles. So the final part of the bill, the third pillar, is the establishment of a Healthy Homes Commissioner who would hold the government's feet to the fire, provide best practice examples, um, enable scrutiny through Parliament, and really try and um, eventually develop uh, to 
in, ensure some degree of enforcement, uh, enforcement mechanisms at, at the local level, because that is ultimately what matters most in the, in the way this system, this system will work. So I think it's really important to define the scope of what we're talking about here. This is a really fundamental shift. Um, as, a, as, a, as a bill, it's relatively limited. Uh, we did get plenty of legal advice on its creation, but we're a small charity and, and uh, this is really a starting point. So it's really important to mention that the bill absolutely does cover neighbourhoods and places as well as individual homes. Uh, we hear a common uh, line of defence from the government, it's that building standards might um, cover everything you need to cover when it comes to health and wellbeing, but obviously they don't cover things like access to green space or walkable neighbourhoods. Uh, it, the bill also covers, like I said, everything beyond planning to housing as well and obscure bits of the infrastructure acts, uh, that's all relevant. Uh, the bill doesn't lay out particular standards, we think that's for the government to do, but the principle that there should be minimum thresholds for these things. Uh, it doesn't actually stop permitted development rights, but what it does is ensures that there is a baseline level of quality for all forms of development. It also doesn't. Um, it, it, it also uh, doesn't con uh, actually touch existing homes. We we would love to develop a way um, that legally that might be workable, but we had to define our scope quite neatly. I think for this project so far, it would still affect thousands of lives and new homes built, but it wouldn't affect uh, existing homes. Um, I think it's also important to mention that uh, it would effectively outlaw new homes and neighbourhoods which fail to meet the principles. So it's quite a powerful piece of legislation. Uh, and then I think I'm going to end on the point on this slide that it, it, the bill concerns health. Health is the organising concept, but I think really it's about much more than that. It's about the way we think about the urban environment and people's place in it. Uh, and it's essentially about social justice. Health is a very useful organising concept and it cuts across the political spectrum and it's something we all value, but really I think this is about social justice. So the bill's not perfect, but it is a really solid, I think, foundation for action. And then uh, really almost, almost at the very end now, I think there are five really arguments from the government's perspective about why this is a, is a useful tool. And I can talk later if people are interested in how we're actually practically gonna try and get this into law. But in terms of the content of the bill, I think there's incredibly strong ethical arguments for this kind of change. You saw just from um, the, my pictures I shared at the beginning of this presentation, um, the kind of new homes which are currently being built uh, with the expansion of permitted development rights so that it covers any conversion uh, from commercial into residential, the extension of, of existing residential buildings by two stories and the demolition of re and rebuild of commercial properties. This is just gonna become more of an issue. I think there's a regulatory argument for all of those who, of us who work in the built environment, and I know there's a few people attending who do. Um, it's, it's, it, even for us, the regulatory systems we have to deal with are incredibly complex. Uh, having that strength, but consistency across regimes in the form of a clear set of principles which cut across all of them um, would provide simplicity as well as strength. Uh, there's, a, there's a governance argument, which is that policy making, which is so often split between central government departments, would, would have to have a degree of uh, conformity across them and break down siloed working. And then I think skipping over the public health um, financial argument, which I mentioned at the start of my slide, there's a real political argument, which is about the government's planning reforms and uh, the clear concerns which so many um, constituents and members of the public have about that and, and surging those concerns. Um, and then finally, the, we, one of the key challenges we, we get with this, um, with this work is that it's just not possible because it might, um, it, it, because of, from an economic point of view, it's just how the market operates and people operate um, on the basis of their free choice in the market and these kind of things. Well, I think quite fundamentally, we've, we base these principles around the basic needs that human beings have to live happily. And if these kind of things can't easily be met, I think it's about changing the way the system works. Uh, I think that's something other speakers have touched on before me in this presentation, in their presentations. So, yeah, I'll leave it there. Thanks a lot. Thanks so much, Daniel. I think um, we, uh, if there's something that we have all realised tonight, that this is a huge topic. And actually, I think we could um, all uh, go on talking about this for some time. Um, we are uh, running a bit behind time, um, but there is still time. So I'm going to um, invite all of our panelists and speakers to, um, to turn on to rejoin the Zoom room um, and we've already got loads of questions um, flooding in. I think I'm going to kind of, uh, I think there's, there's so much to unpack around this subject. I think um, th this question of, you know, Danny, uh, as you said, um, has, has the shine come off city living? Well, was it ever there in the first place? I think that's exactly the right way to be thinking about this. The, the experience of living in cities is already very variable. I think that's something that COVID has really highlighted. I think you know, some of the statistics and the, um, 
evidence that you're providing as part of your campaign and that others have touched on is 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 really quite heartbreaking um and i think you know and a lot of what's being suggested here feels like um common sense it, it's quite astonishing that until only two months ago you could build a bedroom in the uk without access to natural light and ventilation um do uh, is this, a, is this a monitoring problem, I think, is the first question I'm going to ask. Are we, are we it, is well-being almost too loose a term? Are we, are we measuring well-being in the right way, do we think? And I, I think that's a question for either Daniel or Natasha or both of you. Hmm. It's a really interesting question. I think, um, I think we can go even back further than that. So we've got monitoring and understanding um, the built environment as it is. But then I think there's something even before that, which is speaking with uh, decision makers and policy makers about awareness, just fundamental awareness that people live in these conditions. Because I don't think that's there in, in, in a really, um, even down to the level of empathy and uh, the way that the development system at the moment works. I think that's, I think that's the starting point. I think it, it's... It's so frustrating there are so many conversations as i alluded to in my presentation with um really well-meaning people who are trying to create solutions for how we can improve the built environment and i don't think they realize quite how <laughs> how far we've got to go mm. current base level is with with policy makers and I, th I think that's it isn't it i mean natasha do you, do you think there are particular metrics that we should be focusing on as designers um certainly there's 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 sort of um uh social value is already a, a metric um, social return on investment um, is something that gets used. But I think having um, more metrics and more um, frameworks that could be implemented is something that's really, really needed just to make it really uh, accessible, I suppose, to everyone to know um, how you can do that. So I think there's, there's lots of different frameworks, um, but there's no kind of holistic one, I think. If, if you, and this, pro this probably is a huge oversimplification, but if you had to pick one that is the most important um, or one area that you think is the most important in terms of having immediate impact on well-being, would there be one that jumps out? Um, well, I suppose in, in terms of um, what's happening at the moment with um, the pandemic, um, I think uh, sort of sociability and social value and connectedness and those themes are uh, kind of immediate ones but um yeah it's it's hard to sort of say what's what's the most important part of well-being to, I yeah. Think. yeah yeah can i just jump in yes Felicia. Please. um i just want to i don't know if people are aware but the riba publish it's i mean I know everyone is sort of publishing a social value toolkit and there are many of them, but the RIBA has published um, their own social value toolkit, which was for architects for once, not to just measure social value delivered through construction and then procurement, but also social value actually delivered by design. So that's very much part of the post occupancy evaluation. Um, and ideally, this is a tool that you could be using. Um, um, it's sort of through quantitative and qualitative um, uh, measurement, and you could be talking to residents pre and post sort of development and actually really have an idea of, of sort of of measure. So I'd, I'd encourage people to look at it on the RIBA website. I think that um, that post occupancy evaluation point is a really critical one. Um, I just want to tackle some of the questions in the Q&A. Um, Catherine Max is, is asking a question to Jacob, which I think kind of leads on to that, from that, which is um, whether and how density and well-being considerations are being implemented in Barking Riverside, although I know that's not a B-first development. Um, so perhaps I, perhaps I can turn that question into how B-first are thinking about that, Catherine, if you don't mind. Yeah, that's um, that's that's right, Kyle. Uh, Barking Riverside isn't isn't necessarily uh, our patch in terms of our delivery patch, although we are co covering the planning function um, for it. But I think, you know, more generally, how we're feeling about health and well-being and, and priorities. You know, there are key issues that we have. You know, there's some simple metrics around air pollution, um, access to parks, access to community facilities, and these are the things that residents are telling us is is really important and that we need to start. Um, addressing. I think increasingly we're looking at play shaping strategies, you know, we, we've got such a large um, program of new build and we don't just want to be focusing um, on the numbers. So we are building an internal design team at the moment, which is increasingly going to look at place shaping and really kind of focus on these neighbourhood um, issues. 
such as improving, improving access to, to walking routes, to green space, encourage cycling, um, integrate art strategies, wayfinding, et cetera, et cetera, and really think about um, neighborliness uh, through, those, through those strategies. And I think, I think that sense of community is a key tenant in, um, in developing uh, well-being for communities and for residents. Um, we've, we've got about five minutes left and there are loads of questions. So we might um, do something where we try and answer some of them um, in a blog post or something afterwards. But um, this, I just want to just want to pick up on um, this word density and talk about that a bit, because I think, you know, one of the things that um, comes out of trying to understand the impact or the, let's say the relationship between um, the impact of COVID and um, and density is that actually density is a, is a difficult term. And actually, I think in that particular context, overcrowding seems to be a much bigger I issue. And there's a couple of questions about that in uh, the Q&A. So there's one from Bromley Civic Society, um, which is saying whether, whether um, we think there's a limit on the, there should be a limit on the height of residential buildings that can be successful. So um, would a 17 story block of flats be okay? And again, um, Catherine is, is uh, Max is uh, perhaps asking us um, uh, whether we can suggest alternative terms to density. And I think for, uh, I might pass this to Felicia because I think you were suggest you were um, touching on some of these points when you were talking about the relationship between high density and good design. And I think that's a fundamental point here. So perhaps we can just talk about that for a few minutes. We, we could have a whole talk on what is we density. We could have a whole talk on that. <laughs> and we haven't even started defining <laughs> density because surely it must be in comparison to something else uh, because we know we all know density isn't about tall buildings necessarily um it's it's i don't know the other term i don't know it's it's urban life i guess because even density you know you can look at london and actually london is not a dense city by you know any means in sort of com comparison terms with other european cities for example and um so i mean i think one of the statistics that i found really compelling in relation to covid was that actually denser areas had often suffered were less yeah. uh, sorry had suffered less so were better off than lower density areas which was partly i think ascribed to access to healthcare. yes so i think in a way although density might or high density let's say so I don't know if you want to have a go at defining that but let's uh, let's say above 120 I, homes per hectare. I think what will be interesting is with the new London plan coming out on the 2nd of March and yeah. you know, it's they're not I mean it's talking about height there and anything above six stories is considered a tall building and I think that that might I don't know the details but that might have an impact on on how sort of local authorities consider schemes all right so and jacob is is that i mean b first are obviously delivering a number of medium and high density developments um and and i think a big part of that is about delivering affordable housing numbers in the borough um do you want to just talk a bit more about the um perhaps this thing about the spaces around buildings and how um, they can be, how that's central to your approach and how that can be used to foster community. Yeah, I think, I think Felice's point about, you know, density isn't necessarily uh, related to high COVID infections and, you know, London not being particularly dense compared to international comparisons is really important. I think you can look at a lot of um, cities uh, in the Far East, you know, that haven't suffered as badly as London, um, but are a lot more dense. So I think that is really interesting comparison and like I said, uh, when I was talking earlier, you know, LSE are doing a lot of interesting research on this area and mapping, um, mapping density over COVID infections in different cities, which I think is some really interesting visualizations. Mm. I mean, for me, I, I, don't, I don't think density is the issue, but I think it requires good design principles to be delivering it. And I think, you know, you can talk about healthy buildings, you know, we're really investing in the ventilation of our buildings, we're investing in those communal spaces within the building as well. You know, and I think they're really key metrics. So again, it's not about overcrowding those spaces or it's about you know, the buildings being able to breathe and being healthy. So they're really important considerations. And then I think it comes back to a lot of things about what I was saying, you know, access, um, access to public space. And I think you know, in central London or 
you know, in, 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 in inner London areas where you've got the fantastic Royal Parks, you know, they're a real lifesaver. I live fairly close to um, Victoria Park in Tower Hamlets, you know, and throughout the COVID um, period and throughout lockdown, that has been a real lifesaver, you know, and um, especially with, with, with two young kids. Um, and I think that's what we're really thinking, you know, we're pushing medium and high density in our development because delivering that affordable housing for the borough is really important. But what COVID has taught us is that these issues um, around community, around open space, around creating health enablers where people, you know, where we prioritise pedestrian and cycle movement, is really important to do that alongside delivering the numbers and delivering the density. Yeah, and I, th I think that's absolutely right. And, and, and in, no, in no way is, um, you know, uh, good design needing to accompany high density a new idea. But I think perhaps one of the things that the pandemic has shown us is really how important that is and how much emphasis needs to be put on that. I think Daniel wants to um, wants to come in with a point. And yeah, I was just going to uh, jump in. I think um, I think it's a density, what good density is varies according to context. But one of the ways that density, I think, is a really useful tool is to think about the political economy underneath um, who wins and who loses, like thinking through these processes. So if the reason why you need to build high density in a city like London or one of the drivers of it is because you're being strangled by lack of development on the edges of the city, for example, um, that tells you, again, something about who wins and who loses from current development processes and how the system's working and who it's benefiting, which helps us to think about why certain groups are disproportionately affected by things like COVID. So you can see these sort of patterns as you think about particular concepts like density. And I think that's where density gets really interesting in the, con in the context of this debate. Agreed. And I think, I think what is also interesting about well-being and density in parallel is that it becomes a discussion about quality. And I think that, you know, that figure, that NHS figure about the cost of 1.4 billion a year um, from the BRE uh, as a result of um, poor quality housing I think is something that um, that perhaps should focus everybody's minds on the need to deliver um, high quality homes. Um, and we haven't even touched on permitted development, but I think that probably is also a subject for another talk. I think I'm going to have to draw things um, to a, a close at that point. Um, and I think just to say thank you to all of our speakers, um, I think we could go on talking for quite a lot longer and perhaps we should organise a follow up event. Um, and thank you to the London Society and, of course, to everybody uh, who's uh, given up their time to come along and listen this evening. Um, we do have another talk uh, organised between Archeo and the London Society, which is happening on the 22nd of April, where we are looking at the theme of resilient neighbourhoods. So I think it's very likely that we'll pick up some of these themes then. So if you've enjoyed this evening, and I hope you have, um, do come along to that and hope to see you all IRL soon or otherwise. All the best.